So thanks for the introduction. Thanks for putting a great conference together. It's great to come back and see uh, just the the attendance grow and the talks just get more interesting every year. So I'm, I appreciate being here and just learning from people like Mike. Um, I'm going to concentrate and kind of cone down on some things he even talked about, but specifically just for SBRT. So just some reference, I practice uh, outside Charlotte, uh, part of a big consortium called Levine Cancer Institute and part of a big group. Um, and we treat typically with uh, TrueBeam uh, technology. We have integrated surface guided uh, therapy in that with OSMS. So just to give some reference to what I talk about and, and its applications to your practice. So I do have some disco disclosures as far as grant and research support, which I'll talk about. So really five objectives. The first three for, for my talk will concentrate mainly on free breathing SBRT and just uh, integration of service guidance into patient setup and patient monitoring during treatment. We've done some acquisition of data uh, beyond just uh, you know shifts with initial setup that I think is interesting just to show correlation uh, if you do see patient motion during treatment. And then we've gone a step further this year, so we've updated that data, and then we've, we've done some evaluation of the dosimetric consequences of that. So is what we're catching uh, during treatment, is it, is it making a difference dosimetrically? And so I think that's interesting to look at. And then the last part of the talk, I'll concentrate on breath hold, uh, deep inspiration breath hold, SBRT. Uh, we actually do inspiration and deep uh, and, and expiration breath hold. Uh, for SBRT and discuss some of the methods we're using, integration, integrating some of the new technology for image guidance with that. And then looking at things like triggered imaging, different processes, fiducials, uh, versus even just using surface guidance alone for breath hold. <clears throat> so uh, I always like to start with basics. I think as we integrate more and more technologies uh, into our clinic, we kind of forget what the principles of what we're trying to achieve are. And so SBRT is sort of the integration or uh, intersection of a lot of different technologies. And I'm passionate about lung SBRT. It's really what I've done most of my research within. And so we have, uh, Mike did a great job of showing some mobilization devices that we buy specifically for SBRT, whether that's really necessary or not. I think that's an interesting concept. We integrate IGRT into uh, many things within our clinic, but specifically for SBRT, it's essential. Uh, we're not going to be able to get rid of, rid of that. Um, and then treatment planning and delivery technologies have sped our treatments up, but they've also made, them, made the impact of, of things during treatment even that more significant. So mobilization is great. We want to make sure we're mobilizing well, but it's not going to eliminate the need for uh, monitoring during treatment, and it's not, it's not going to uh, eliminate the variability between treatments uh, that our patients are in. So that's where service guidance come in, comes in. And then IGRT, both before treatment and during treatment, can be cumbersome. I think there are a lot of technologies you have to think about adding. Uh, it may involve invasive procedures, which I'll talk a lot about. And there can be some technical challenges depending on the site you're treating and what you're trying to track. Uh, and this is where I feel like surface guidance comes in because it's a, it's a global technology that really starts with the beginning of SBRT and ends with the end and allows you to uh, do additional things such as breath hold as well. So just a little bit about our process. I think pr pretty similar to most people uh, and what we're doing as far as ROI uh, uh, evaluation. We, typically track the chest, we define it from basically the collarbone down to the xiphoid process for specifically for lung SBRT. Uh, for, for SBRT specifically, we have to make sure we eliminate things like the abdominal compression plate if we're using that or any of the uh, invasive things that may affect our region of interest for, for SBRT specifically. Um, we're capturing cone beam CT prior to treatment and we have a 6D couch. Uh, and then we, we do acquire a respiratory gated surface after that shift and treatment position, and then the patient's free breathing typically during treatment. We're monitoring uh, patient, uh, patients continuously and have been for almost seven years now and collecting that data. So we started, a lot of times you, you set your thresholds high. We set our threshold really low to begin with for SPRT, so we defined uh, something we were concerned about is two millimeters or greater, and that's a really tight threshold. Obviously, we're using margins that are larger than that, but we wanted to see what the technology gave us and what it did. And obviously, as we define that region of interest, you're, you're going to deal with some chest wall motion due to respiration if they're free breathing. So we put a time limit on that of, of two seconds. So if patients were outside that threshold, we, we 
stop the treatment and often when we'll go proceed with a second cone beam CT. So we just started collecting data. There wasn't a lot of data on continuous monitoring for, uh, with surface guidance during SBRT, especially for the lung. And so we just wanted to see what that data looked like as far as correlation. So we took suggested shifts with surface guidance and then additional shifts on made on cone beam CT and we just compared those with, with a pretty simple study. So we looked at about 60 patients uh, overall, just for patient setup and, and monitoring to begin with. Uh, and in about 10% uh, of our fractions, we were finding some sort of indicated shift based on surface guidance. Uh, so about 340 fractions, we had 34 of them which had a suggested shift. And 75% of the time when we repeated comb MCT on these patients, there was a subsequent shift of at least two millimeters. Uh, and then we, we compared that data both from a vector standpoint but also individual uh, parameters as far as the shifts, and I'll show that in a second. But the, the correlation was, was outstanding. I mean, you'd expect that, but at the same time, uh, there's various factors that can affect internal target position compared to patient uh, position. And so it was nice to see good correlation. Uh, you can see the, the bar graph here kind of represents that. So the shifts that were suggested by service guidance are in blue and the subsequent shifts in cone beam are in orange. So there's some outliers as well. So uh, I think those are important to point out as, as uh, other factors potentially contributing. So there were times where surface guidance suggested uh, a larger shift than was actually made and there were times where surface guidance actually suggested a smaller shift than were actually made. And so I think that's important from a standpoint of what it, what it allows us to do, what the technology allows us to monitor. Here's uh, our updated data, um, just based on, on those patients. And you can see just nice correlation throughout vertical, longitudinal, lateral. None of those were statistically significant differences. A little bit more variation on the, on the rotational uh, 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 shifts, but uh, that would be expected just based on what we're tracking. Um, a scatter plot there to kind of represent so a big cluster around two to four millimeters, a couple outliers but really just nice correlation of that data to say that we're catching legitimate things uh, within the patient that are happening to change an internal target position. So why does it matter? Uh, one, uh, does it matter if a patient moves, um, especially you know, a smaller shift? Does that affect your dosimetry? I think it's important to look at that. We've done a lot of work uh, within physics on uh, you know, patient shifts during treatment for actual motion monitoring and whether that uh, provide or actually leads to dosimetric effects. So we took the 11 largest shifts, which ended up being around five millimeters or greater in all of them, and just calculated the effects, uh, replan the patients uh, as if we had not performed interfraction and correction on those patients. And we looked at PTV and ITV coverage as well as looking at max spinal cord dose. Um, and then we also looked at reduction of PT meter margins. So Mike did a nice job talking about that a little bit as well. So we took uh, our plans and replan them at two millimeter, four millimeter margins, and you can kind of see what that looks like. Uh, and just looked at all of that to see if it made a difference. So again, the, the mean overall shift was greater than five millimeters on this subset of patients. Um, but the PTV coverage, uh, you can see significantly dropped from 95 to 88 percent, which was statistically significant. Uh, if you look at PTV minimum dose, which some of us look at for SPRT, we want to see a specific minimum dose threshold as well. That was also significantly lower. <clears throat> and uh, finally, looking at ITV, obviously we put margins on structures for a reason. So our standard margin is still five uh, millimeters in the lung and liver. Uh, <clears throat> and so for this, you know, the ITV coverage wasn't significantly changed uh, and remained at 100% for five millimeter margins. When we started to go down on PTV margins uh, all the way to two millimeters, we started to see that ITV coverage decline uh, down to about 95% at two millimeters on average. So here's a good example of a patient, a coronal view. You can see the ITV in orange and the PTV in yellow is a standard five millimeter expansion. And this patient has significant longitudinal shift during treatment. Um, and so you can see that isodose, uh, those isodose curves shift uh, corresponding to that uh, internal shift uh, longitudinally. 
the 54 or 100 or the 100 dose isodose iso -dose line being a red and then uh, the green being the 50 percent isodose line and the dvh analysis look you know basically confirmed basically what the results say which is a reduction in ptv uh, coverage but itv is is maintained at 100 percent so what do we do now what do, what is this data i think it's you don't just collect data and study it uh, you want to imp implement it into your clinic um, so all of our patients, 100% are set up with service guidance prior to coming MCT. We're essentially a, not using marks for, for SBRT at this point. We're a tattoo-less clinic at this point. We rarely use marks, so we're doing all service guidance for patients set up. Uh, we're doing coming MCT prior, obviously, um, and then capturing, uh, again, a gated capture for free breathing patients monitoring patients through treatment. We've increased our tolerances based on this data really to three millimeters. So what that did was two things. One, um, it allowed us to reduce in some of the heavy breathers the, uh, the patient going out of tolerance for even short periods of time so that the treatment wasn't being gated for just respiratory uh, motion uh, or chest wall motion variants. And the other thing is that it's increased our rate of finding uh, significant shift. So uh, talked about on our data, about 75% of the time we actually make a shift on subsequent image imaging, it's now about 100%. So just based on looking at a different threshold, I think you can kind of cone down on, on what are actually meaningful shifts or what you're, catch, of what you're catching. <clears throat> and then for PTV margins, we're so confident in the data, I think, at this point that it correlates so well that we have looked at smaller PTV margins for SBRT. We're not going down to two millimeters. I don't <laughs> want anybody to think that that's uh, valid at this point, but we have gone to four or three in certain locations uh, next to critical organs at risk, um, especially near esophagus, near airways, uh, where we're, we're concerned a little bit about uh, overlap of PTV with those, with those organs. So switching now, I'm gonna talk a lot about respiratory motion management uh, with surface guidance. Um, again, kind of the basics of, of why we do this, um, but also how we can do this. There's a lot of different techniques, inhibition or compression, gating and tracking, and almost all those add, add things or add disadvantages to the clinic potentially, but I think service guide, guidance does a great job of integrating a lot of things into one. <clears throat> so abdominal compression, we're still using this a lot. I think it's probably the most common thing used uh, still uh, around to, to eliminate uh, tumor motion or, or uh, to limit tumor motion. But obviously we have patients where no matter how hard we compress, they still have target displacements with, uh, with respir respiration greater than a centimeter. So the other thing is for liver, I, I hate doing abdominal compression. Uh, it pushes organs towards targets. And I've never had a patient tell me they liked abdominal compression. Uh, <laughs> it's never happened. I don't think it ever will happen. Uh, it's uncomfortable, patients complain about it. It's the one thing about SPRT that I think is, is truly, you know, if, if we were to say it's invasive, it's the only thing that's getting towards invasive about SPRT. Um, and so, it's, and it's usually the patients that, you know, complain the most that probably need it the most. So um, we, we often see those, those tumors move quite a bit. Uh, gating, tracking, again, this re sometimes requires technologies. We have Calypso systems, we have fiducials uh, that can be invasive, require invasive procedures, and we have you know, IGRT systems that can be technically challenging, or maybe they're even tracking something. It always amazes me that we have centers that do volumetric imaging, match your tumor, and then we track the bone, which has really no correlation to the tumor uh, during the treatment. And so we it's nice to have service guidance during, during that uh, interfraction motion, but also just from a gating perspective, I think we have some potential to improve on that. <clears throat> so what, what are we doing as far as respiratory motion management? We're trying to stabilize the, the tumor within the respiratory cycle for gating or breath hold. Um, and for gating, there's issues with irregularity of breathing, uh, treatment time. Uh, and then there's also, you know, uh, additional technology like ABC that we may, we may have to consider for those kind of uh, breath hold technologies. So what are we doing for breath hold? Um, we've integrated fast comb beam CT, which shorter comb beam CT into our TrueBeam 
uh, within the last few months, and so we're utilizing that as a way to, to image during breath hole, which has been a nice addition. Um, but the process for us starts at simulation. I think there's two things that simulation are important. One is we still do a free breathing scan for ECT. There's two reasons for that. One is we like to have a region of interest based on free breathing that we use for setup. And then secondly, whether they're a good or an important candidate for breath hold. So is that tumor moving enough to where it really makes a difference to treat them at deep inspiration breath hold? It also, at simulation, we, we assess patient tolerability. So obviously we're with primary lung, SBRT, we're treating a lot of patients that are unable to go, unable to go undergo surgical resection. They may be on oxygen. There's other barriers to deep inspiration breath hold that can be assessed. So we practice with them uh, multiple times, uh, assess their tolerability, and then we do helical scans uh, at breath hold, uh, whichever position we think is more of an advantage or more consistent, uh, either in inspiration or in expiration. Um, planning wise, it's very similar. Just to emphasize, though, we do create a region of interest both for free breathing and uh, breath hold scans. Um, and then the treatment, where really where kind of the action is as far as uh, differences, uh, we set up with a free breathing. We then uh, do a breath hold with the patient. I'll show that in a second, where we uh, adjust their position. So we're, we're adjusting their position based on breath hold. We then do a short arc comb beam CT at breath hold, perform our PTB match, uh, all the while we're tracking the patient. So we're making sure that they're not moving based on that uh, surface image while, while we match that. <clears throat> and then we do a capture at breath hold at that new position. And that's where there's kind of a rapid uh, sequence of events that happens on the table uh, just to ensure that we're capturing at that new position. And then we're gating the beam uh, with breath hold on that new capture. So why do breath hold? I think similarly to our approach when we initiated surface guidance into SBRT in our clinic, does it have any benefit to, to do breath hold in these patients? We have a lot of data that it reduces uh, dose to lung. We have data that it reduces the volume of lung treated, but does that actually translate to toxicity? That's what I want to study going forward. Um, does it translate to toxicity related to pneumonitis or other SBRT related toxicities? And what's the reliability? So <clears throat> a lot of us are integrating fiducials or triggered imaging. We do triggered imaging along with uh, surface guidance like Mike was talking about for prostate fiducials uh, and lung. But what's the reliability of surface guidance without fiducials? And I, I don't think there's a lot of data on that yet, which, which uh, is interesting to study. And are the fiducials actually helpful? Do they benefit? You know, does a patient benefit from having fiducials in the lung? So this is an example of a, a patient that would benefit from breath hold, in my opinion. See the, the IT, IGTV that's contoured at free breathing is obviously a much larger, I call that a hot dog target because it basically takes a spherical target and turns it into what looks like a hot dog. And it, I cringe every time I see this and I'm reviewing my colleagues' treatment plans because we're treating a ton of lung that we don't need to treat in that patient. Uh, and there's a better way to go about it. So here's an example of the use of fiducials with like an RPM system. We're gating uh, during respiration and we're confirming with triggered imaging that our target is where we expect it to be by utilizing fiducials and triggered imaging. <clears throat> so fiducials, well, it's nice to see that, it's nice to have that confirmation. There's a lot of disadvantages to fiducials. I was born in the 80s, I, I think fondly of the British invasion of the 80s, bringing us great music and great hair, uh, but most things that are invasive are not, are, not, uh, are not good. And SBRT is the one treatment in the lung where the patient can go through the entire treatment without, without any invasive procedures, really. Uh, we don't tattoo patients, we don't have to uh, use contrast in most cases. Uh, so they don't even get an IV, much less uh, <clears throat> uh, exposing them to a risk uh, through bronchoscopic implantation or CT guided implantation of fiducials. There's risks of bleeding, pneumothorax, added costs. And so I think we need to think hard about whether this is routinely need, needed or uh, just something that, that we like to see to, to confirm. So we're actually studying this prospectively. We actually have a trial that's on going to open in the next couple of weeks, looking specifically at breath hold SBRT. Primary endpoint is actually toxicity, so it'll be interesting to see does breath hold actually affect toxicity. 
Uh, we're looking at all SB, SBRT related toxicity and also looking at the toxicity of fiducial placement as well. And then looking at a lot of secondary endpoints. So the way this, this will be structured is in patients getting primary long SBRT where uh, tumors are moving at least a centimeter. Uh, so it may benefit from breath hold. <clears throat> We're treating three different arms. So 15, uh, basically a free breathing kind of standard arm. And then we have two breath hold arms. So one where we're doing surface guidance alone, and then another where we're doing surface guidance with, with implanted fiducials. And so it'd be interesting to see the reliability of, of surface guidance without fiducials compared to with fiducials. Do the fiducials add anything? Do we need to be putting them in? I'm hoping we don't, but we'll see. <clears throat> so we've uh, probably done three or four patients with uh, since integration of fast comb BMCT for verification. Um, our setups are nice for seeing very low shifts from first setup to comb MCT. So that's nice to see that we're still, there's no <clears throat> interplay with, with the breath hold aspect of that as affecting patient setup. And then we have been doing routine, uh, additional comb MCT in the middle of treatment. And we've seen no additional shifts thus far, thus far on the patient. So wait again, way too early to kind of say that it's hundred percent reliable, but thus far we've been really happy. Um, an example of a patient treated with breath hold in our clinic, I think this is the ideal example really, someone lower lung tumor moves a lot right next to the esophagus, right next to the stomach. We were actually able to increase her dose to the tumor and avoid overdosing the, the stomach and the esophagus uh, just based on having the breath hold technology in her. So it's something to think about uh, in specific patients and I think um, that uh, we can reduce toxicity. So just conclusions, um, I think surface guidance really represents a global spectrum across SBRT treatments that we can utilize for patient setup, patient monitoring, deep inspiration breath hold. I think it's an essential part of SBRT treatments, at least for those first two, even if you're not doing breath hold. <clears throat> I think it's a reliable part. The, the, the data really shows good correlation. And I think the dosimetric effects, while maybe not being uh, severe in the patient population we looked at, Clearly, there's going to be dosimetric effects if we don't account for these. So it's a powerful tool to reduce that. <clears throat> um, and then within breath hold, I think it's a promising technique. Uh, it should allow for hopefully non-invasive breath hold uh, that can be combined with intrafraction monitoring. So just some acknowledgments. I work with a great team in Concord, and a lot of this data was acquired through them. So I uh, just wanted to acknowledge them and happy to Take questions. Looks like I do have some time, hopefully. Risling, I appreciate it. Um, do you guys use 10 triple F for this or 6 triple F? Like when you're doing the SBRTs, what energy you guys use? We're doing 6 triple F. 6 triple F. Is there any talk of going to 10 for the dose rate, making it faster or? Uh, for to go to ten, yeah, we have used ten in the lung before. We we tend to you know, shy, shy away. away from that. Yeah, uh, I would say I mean our standard for liver is ten triple okay. off. So gotcha. Um, we'd like to use deep inspiration breath hold for for liver as well. We're not studying that, but I think once we we for in our clinic once we establish it in the lung, we're moving right into liver next. Very cool. Thank you. Um, hello, over here. So the uh, video that you showed, it looked like it was an exhale breath hold. It was. Is, do you uh, do all your patients exhale breath hold for we long? Have, we've done both. Uh, I actually, I found the exhale is a little bit easier for patients, especially patients with pul pulmonary status. Um, that being said, obviously we, we have a lot of experience with, we probably have more experience with deep inspiration, um, just from the standpoint that's what we're doing in our breast. But <clears throat> from a dosimetric standpoint, we want to kind of look at that. Obviously, you have more lung volume, but whether that actually translates to pneumonitis risk is, I think, a little bit up in the air. Okay. How about for liver? Do you see any preference one way versus the other? So preferably for me, I would do whatever is easier for the patient to tolerate. So I think you get out of the, the situation where your lung volume might matter in the liver. Uh, so deep expiration is probably going to be what we try first. Thanks. Thank yeah. you very much for the talk. 
Um, I was wondering, I noticed that uh, you use a DICOM reference for setup, for additional setup, and then you recapture for monitoring. Correct. Have you studied any correlations like what the relative shifts are between these two references uh, or any? So like we did acquire all our shift data based on patient setup. Uh, I didn't show that because I'd shown that a couple of years ago. Um, we, it's been a couple of years since we presented that, but we actually did a comparison between imaging setup with KV imaging and service guided setup, and there was no difference. So they were equally as good. And our our setup shifts are are tiny. I mean, five millimeters from setup to comb UCT. Have um, you tried to use the original reference then for surface imaging as well, or? That wouldn't work. Well, well, that's what we do. So we use for the DICOM. I mean, for monitoring as well. <clears throat> if we don't make a shift, we can do that. But if we make a shift, it's going to automatically take your tolerance out. So, so the, we, comb, we have the to comb in city always waits. Uh, for me, yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, <clears throat> there's nothing in my research that wants to get rid of volumetric imaging, especially now that we can do it so fast. I want to see the tumor. What I'm confident in now is that once I set that tumor in that right position, that going forward, I know that that's where it is. Great, thank you so much.